As a child, Dado Banatao had to walk barefoot every day for miles just to get to school. But dropping out was never an option. A tech visionary, his inventions are part of almost every personal computer in the world. His first high-tech company, Mostron, which he founded together with Francis Sue in 1984, manufactured motherboards. He is currently a managing partner of Talwood Venture Capital, a firm that is focused on semiconductor technology solutions for computing, communication, and consumer platforms. An alumnus of Mapua, University of Washington, and Stanford, Dado is a firm believer in the transformative powers of education. His philanthropic activities promote and provide scholarships to admirable Filipino students in the fields of engineering and technology. Ladies and gentlemen, the managing partner of Tallwood Venture Capital, Mr. Jostado Panatao. So hi, good, good afternoon. Before I proceed with this, I would like to introduce to the public here the Board of Trustees and staff at FILDEV. FILDEV is a foundation uh, helping the country eradicate its poverty on three legs, education, innovation, and entrepreneurship. So could you please, guys, stand? <laughs> Thank you. You know, this theme of this year's uh, APEC Summit, uh, Building Inclusive Economies, is very appropriate since APEC is a combination of many, many countries. And uh, some of those are still developing countries and others are already well developed. And so my main message to APEC itself this afternoon is to consider policies and practices among countries to be very inclusive. So let me shift now to a more relevant inclusiveness within uh, the boundaries of our country. Um, when we talk about an inclusive economy, we generally mean a sustainable participation of low and mid-income earners in the growth, growth of the economy. When full participation happens, the gap between the rich and the poor is insignificant and proves that economic growth is the only known solution to poverty. But what are the factors that drive growth in an economy, specifically a developing economy like the Philippines? Experts agree that a local economy is sustained by the capacity of its population to save, meaning save money. Those savings are the key enablers for investments. Minimal, <clears throat> minimal growth in savings mean a minimal rate of economic growth. Also, when the rich are the only source of significant savings, the gap between the rich and the poor widens. To jumpstart growth, one must access the global market, which is infinite in size compared to the local economy. This is now possible because the global market is open, highly integrated in its infrastructures, and is always in need for high-value technology-based products. Besides growth in exports, which induces growth in GDP, another benefit is that it brings foreign direct investments, which further brings in more technology and global market knowledge. This is all due to innovation. Innovation is the means to become integrated, therefore, in the global market. However, countries that do not have a strong base of globally competitive scientists and engineers will not be able to enter the global market with competitive value-add technology-based products. 
They do participate in low-wage services from the global market, but not sufficient to grow the economy substantially. In developing economies, it is the government, academe, and industry's role to build an adequate foundation of scientists and engineers, significant in size and expertise to compete in the open global market. When it happens, innovation begins and the ability to access global market is enhanced, but not necessarily sufficient. It does not imply, in fact, inclusive growth. At this level of expertise, the other known driver for inclusive growth is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship properly designed where entrepreneurial equity is fairly awarded among entrepreneurs, employees, and investors is known to be the fastest diffusion of wealth to the population. Entrepreneurship also plays its role in that knowledge and expertise are more valuable than money. Innovators and those participating, participating in risk-taking through entrepreneurship get the proper reward for their product innovation. Observe that this group, if risk-takers, <clears throat> excuse me, may come from all segments of the population, rich or poor, and no regard to societal influences. This is the best and more lasting form of economic inclusion. The last requirement for full population inclusion to economic growth is education for all. Developing economies unfortunately has a high population of the poor where education stops at a very young age simply due to affordability or non-affordability for proper education, where there are thousands of very bright students from poor families that never get to explore the possibilities of their intellect, creativity, and energy. I claim, therefore, that when we discuss inclusiveness, we must widen the scope of our discussion to include the poor not from what they can derive from economic growth, but more importantly, what they can contribute to growth when properly enabled. There is no other option. So let me talk about uh, a little bit about my background. I describe myself towards the end of my talk, actually. I come from the north, uh, from a, a very humble family. My father was a rice farmer. Uh, we were, I wouldn't consider we were poor because there was always food on the table because, again, my father was a farmer. But there were no other uh, things beyond that. I went to, as shown in the, in the video there, uh, I walked barefoot to school, rain or shine, and that uh, books, there were no textbooks in those days. However, uh, it is significant, and I, this I cannot forget, because we learned in that school at first grade arithmetic using 20 bamboo sticks. And to me, that's very significant, because that was the very first time that I fell in love with, let's just call it generally mathematics. In those days, at first grade, you just call it arithmetic. But I was intrigued by the possibilities of what the mind can come up with based on that discipline of mathematics. And so uh, I was lucky that my grandmother was the principal of that uh, elementary school, and she saw to it that um, I went to a good high school. In those days, there was still the Ateneo de Tugigarao in Cagayan. It's not there anymore. Uh, but that was, a, a, to me, a revelation as to how one can learn using critical thinking. You see, the Jesuits, I believe, are very, very good teachers. And, and somehow, it, in those days, I didn't know that. I was just trying to learn everything that they taught us. But only in graduate school, I realized that they were doing things uh, that already involved that aspect of 
thinking and that's critical thinking in solving any problem or any lesson. Uh, my mother, uh, uh, I'd say I was in a boarding house uh, with a little room, a little table to do homework and bed on the side. Imagine uh, an 11 year old kid, I was 11 years old when I started high school, all alone, no one to talk to, no supervision. I tell you it was really lonely, it was hard. But I persevered, continued for four years, that kind of environment. And that brought me to uh, that first learning that, you know, if you work hard, you can actually achieve many things. My grades from high school were superior and I was able to enter Mapua Institute of Technology, enrolled in electrical engineering, and because of that grades, my grades, uh, I got full scholarship. So that helped my father uh, in the not having to take care of me uh, taking more loans uh, from the rice, from the yield of the rice field. Uh, but you know, when there's, when there's bad weather, uh, the yield was not great, and so the loan continues. But he saw to it that we all studied. I have three other siblings, two brothers and one sister. And that we, all of us went through that process. Uh, so after graduating from Mapua, I was really looking ahead to uh, getting a good uh, engineering job. And I was specifically, I was looking for a design job. You know, in engineering, you are taught to create things, especially products using all the mathematics and physics and other things that you learned in classroom and in, of course in the laboratory, I was not able to find any design job at that time. I hope the situation now is far better because as an engineer, you, you look for that and that's why you, know, you, you persevere in all of those tough, tough courses uh, just so you can do what you, you, what you are to like. So that led me to um, a very different discipline, uh, and that is, I thought, if I cannot find the job I want, I might as well do ex something exciting. So I joined Philippine Airlines as a pilot trainee and started flying. Where is Tony here? I will fly for you anytime, Tony. So except that red color, I don't know about that. No, seriously, that's what I did. But it turned out that that was my ticket to go to the United States, Washington, uh, in Seattle. Boeing hired me as a design engineer for the 747 project. I felt like I was in heaven. Designing, finally, I don't know, I, I just could not believe that I was there working with other engineers on the 747 project. At the time I joined, the rollout of the 747 was two years away, so there was a lot of systems integration, and I handled a few of those uh, in the 747. However, I realized that if you look at the market of airplanes, it's actually small. How many airplanes will they design, will they design every year? And how many engineers were there already practicing the trade, designing airplanes. There were thousands of them before me. So I got curious and I started to look into other fields. And there is this field or a bunch of courses actually from Stanford and Berkeley that is called uh, solid state device physics. And I really love physics also beside math. I didn't know it then, but I was so intrigued, and I looked at the books, uh, the recommended textbooks, and I thought, whoa, this could get me tied up for a long time. And so, and I looked at other schools. Berkeley at that time was also an excellent school. Um, so I enrolled at Stanford in, under that program in computer architecture and solid state device physics. Little did I know that years later, it is what we call semiconductors. So you deal with materials, exotic materials, 
the silicon wafers and things like that and begin to understand the mathematics of it, the physics and so on. And um, when I finally understood taking those courses, uh, for example, uh, just to explain a little bit about the math of it, the current equation of a solid state transistor uh, parallels the equation of electromagnetic theory. Essentially what it is, your chip, the chips that you have in your phones and computers, that whole thing, if you jack up the power sufficient enough and do this, you'll go crazy just on the chips, not even the radio side. But it's, it works. And again, you know, that is something that uh, I really love. And so my career in Silicon Valley spans 40 years now. First as a design engineer, uh, manager, vice president of engineering. And then I had the courage to take some risks and started a company. The first company failed. The idea was good, but we ran out of money. We didn't know how to raise that much amount. A year later, uh, I didn't give up. I came up with a slightly better design and was able to raise sufficient amount of money uh, of all things from a real estate developer and some friends. And uh, I was glad that that company grew and uh, we took it public. And to this day, that is still the company, the, the record has not been broken, even in Silicon Valley, the fastest to IPO. We took that company in 22 months from start to IPO at NASDAQ. And so I had that courage again. I mean, it strengthened my confidence. I could take more risks. So I started yet another company uh, where a lot of the fundamentals of graphics that you see in your uh, PC or other devices, smartphones, came from there. I re-architected the entire PC to be able to process graphics and video uh, significantly faster and more colors and so on. After we took that public, I became a VC or as they say, I went to the dark side. In other words, I am now across the entrepreneur for the first time. But I had fun. I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. And let me wrap this up where that is the key uh, initiative, one of the key initiatives of FieldDev. We have programs now working with the government, academe, USAID, and other partners in instilling that knowledge of entrepreneurship through using innovation. I think it's going to be good in the next 20 years. Uh, the lady who mentioned that the Philippines is singled out to be a center for innovation, sometime, I think she said, 20 years? We will make that happen. I guarantee you. Thank you very much, Mr. Banatao. We have time for two questions. Two questions. We have our first one. Please approach the mic. Oh, the ushers will bring the microphone to you. Hi, um, good morning. I just accompanied my father here, but um, I was moved by your story, and um, I'm glad that you were able to, you know, for your, from your humble beginnings, get to where you are right now. Um, anyway, to, um, my, my question is about the manufacturing industry. What exactly is the Philippine government, um, or how exactly, what is your role your, um, about, you know, our manufacturing um, sector right now for innovation, for high-tech innovation? Um, how competitive are we compared to um, Thailand and Malaysia when it comes to these? And when they give, act they give multinationals um, much better incentives rel relative to the Philippines. Um, in addition, our electricity is one of the highest or is the highest in Southeast Asia, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Whoa, okay, let me handle the first one first. <laughs> Uh, manufacturing. I believe there are two or three companies here now in the Philippines, uh, more along the lines of EMS, 
uh, more on the systems, manufacturing, uh, assembly, and a little bit of design. And I think they're fairly successful at that. The issue happens when you go into more complex manufacturing where you have to bring in sophisticated materials, gases, clean water, like semiconductors, a lot of sophisticated gases need to be uh, used. And in that other side of manufacturing, I don't think we have the resources. What happens is that, yeah, if you have the money, you can set it up, but very quickly you have to import a lot of those exotic materials just to manufacture something. And that's probably not a sustainable uh, proposition. And uh, there are other manufacturing uh, endeavors similar to that or less complex. I think that we need to develop a few of the, uh, I would say, necessary material systems so that we can then fully manufacture products within the country, supported by, and here's where the EMS, um, EM, let's see, hang on. Uh, small SMEs, small to medium enterprises, some of them, if they innovate, and that's probably my best definition of what an SME is, they should also practice innovation there with hard sciences. But if there is such an effort here, those um, SMEs can then support that manufacturing uh, prerogative. If they can, then there's one company that should do it all, but that's hard to fund. And so I would say the cooperation of SMEs, given a large market target, should be enough for a lot of the uh, investors here to fund, because that, those are huge markets. Uh, I think this last is the question, last please. question, yeah. Uh, Sir Dado, I'm Cesar Tolentino. I don't know if you still remember me. I just have one question. Uh, sir, would it be okay if I can spend 15 minutes of your time later after your talk for a private uh, consultation and seeking of advice later after? Uh, yeah, we could have a glass of beer and okay. that'll be okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll meet you later on I, that side of okay, the Okay, I don't know my schedule yet this afternoon, so just hang on. Uh, I'll probably be around here and so on. Okay. Just immediately after the talk, sir. 15 minutes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonatow. A cold one with this guy is a good idea any day. <laughs>